I've made quite a few videos about bikes from the 1970s that were influenced heavily by this bike we're talking about today. The motorcycle that many would argue really is the GOAT. Now if you're a little older, you might not know what this term means, but GOAT is greatest of all time. And judging by my analytics and demographics, some of you might not know that. <laughs> This is the CB750, and you can make entire videos just about the influence of the Honda CB750, whether it's the ongoing development of inline four engines in the motorcycle world, to the massive increase in reliability in motorcycles, to the way that this bike really helped bring down the British motorcycle industry. But today we're looking specifically at the bike itself, how it was developed, what kind of bike it really was, and why there might be some misconceptions about about this motorcycle. The story of the CB750 really starts in 1967. Honda had just taken three of the Grand Prix titles in 66, but they decided to take a break from racing to bring their high-revving, multi-cylinder performance motorcycles to the production side and to the general public. Despite their worldwide success making reliable, utilitarian, single-cylinder and twins, and some sporty machines, you know, think innovative bikes like the double overhead cam CB450, it was time to make a new kind of motorcycle. Regardless of their progress made on the racetrack, 1966 actually marked a downturn in sales for Honda, specifically in the United States. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday really has never been Honda's business model. The United States was longing for a new kind of big motorcycle. The CB450 really was already in many ways a superior sporting machine to virtually anything the British had to offer, but bigger was still better here in the US. So a Bonneville 650 or a you know big BSA twin, it was still viewed as a bigger, faster motorcycle, even though a CB450 was probably a better sporting machine already. Honda had recently received word that the king of big sport bikes, which was Triumph, was developing a three-cylinder 750cc motorcycle, and that really gave Honda the benchmark in terms of just the size. But in their case, they wanted to do one more cylinder, and 750cc was the mark, bigger than anything offered by any Japanese company, and ultimately better than anything that Triumph would ever be able to drum up. Honda's goals with the CB750 were basically this. Stability at cruising speed, reliable powerful braking, comfortable low vibration riding, reliability at every level including electronics, longer service intervals than the competition, and an original, beautiful, appealing design utilizing the best materials. Basically, the ultimate motorcycle. The company brought together a large 20-member team made up of the best minds at Honda to basically design and develop this motorcycle. Two major decisions were made in developing a reliable, powerful, compelling, but also cost-effective inline four-cylinder engine, and those two major decisions are actually more about what was left out versus what was included. See, Honda knew how to make high-revving multi-cylinder engines, and also don't count out the influence of Honda's early Formula One race cars as well in the design of this kind of multi-cylinder engine, but one needs to look no further than the iconic RC160 a 250cc six-cylinder race engine revving past 18,000 RPM and powering Honda to dominance in 1966. But even beyond that, Honda knew how to make high-revving inline force. They had made so many of them for racing. But that RC166 engine and all of Honda's other race engines at the time utilized double overhead cams and repped four valves per cylinder. I mean, even the CB450 was a double overhead cam. But early on, Honda decided to make the CB750 a single overhead cam with just two valves per cylinder. And that is the first major decision and the main thing that was sort of left out in comparison to those race engines is that they decided to go with less valves and less cam. But also, so Honda decided to go with chain-driven gearbox and cams over gear-driven ones, and this made the bike more cost-effective and helped bring the weight down. The thing is though, even with those concessions, as we could call them, versus their race bikes, Honda still had on their hands what would be the most advanced, big, multi-cylinder motorcycle available. Honda did not need to utilize every single piece of their most advanced engineering skills and feats 
to build the best motorcycle in the world. And in fact, operating at about, I don't know, 75% in terms of what they could build was actually ideal. They could be able to keep the cost down, which as we'll see is really the icing on the cake for the CB750's dominance, but also make a bike that just was better for the general public. <laughs> Now, one of the most interesting concessions when it comes to this engine is the use of plain bearings versus rolling bearings. That decision to use plain bearings has everything to do with revs. With this setup, the CB750 would never be able to rev the way that their race engines did, and again, I actually think that this is a wise decision. Aside from the advantages of regular bearings, because they do have advantages, I actually think a lower revving inline 4 was the way to go for Honda in building the ultimate road bike. Motorcycles that may Make most of their power way up in the rev range take a lot more skill to ride and aren't actually more fun. And when you think about the motorcycles that were available in the 1960s, I mean, even the fastest motorcycles in the world on the production side were pretty much just torquey twins that hadn't really changed much in the 10 years prior to this bike coming out. This was already going to be a completely new kind of motorcycle just in the fact that it was a somewhat high revving inline four, but making it rev to like 15,000 RPM would not have helped the bike at all. Honda needed to be able to still bring over people who were used to Bonnevilles and used to, you know, BSAs and Nortons and all of the big twins that were available, and even people who were riding, you know, CB450s and CB350s. So keeping the revs to a minimal amount actually was a better option. Honda also chose to give the 750 inline 4 an undersquare bore to stroke ratio, unlike anything else in Honda's line at this time, and mainly this helped to keep the engine width down, and because hitting, you know, ridiculously high revs was not the purpose, it didn't need to be over square. Regardless, the CB750 really let the proof be in the numbers, 67 horsepower at 8,000 RPM, 44 foot-pounds of torque at 7,000 RPM, and a standing quarter mile time of 13.5 seconds, hitting just over 100 mile per hour in the quarter mile, which is really good numbers. I mean, even today, but at that point, absolutely outstanding numbers for this time. To put this into perspective, the performance machine coveted by riders across the globe for the past 10 years or so prior to this bike coming out was the Triumph Bonneville, which produced maybe 50 horsepower and, you know, quarter mile times aren't as simple to find for these bikes, but I can tell you they're nowhere near what the CB750 was hitting. The iconic Kawasaki Mach 3 was actually faster in the quarter mile and did beat the 750 to production, but the CB750 would prove itself to be just an all-around better motorcycle in almost every area. I think the main thing you have to understand with these early inline fours, despite their incredible performance, is that they came from the factory actually in a quite mild state of tune because for Honda, the goal really wasn't to make some crazy high revving inline four. I mean, if they had wanted to make this bike produce like 85 horsepower, they could have given it double overhead cams and made it rev to the moon. And sure, it would have been, you know, a feat, but that was not what they were trying to do at all. Because for Honda, the goal was not a crazy high revving inline four. It wasn't meant to be some sort of production racer, and having the bike set up in sort of a mild state of tune meant that the rideability of the bike went way up, especially at low speeds. And in that sense, it's much more like, say, you know, Indian or Henderson's wonderful four-cylinder touring machines from, you know, an era long gone at this point, than, say, a modern inline four that revs to the moon. With massive amounts of time spent testing in sort of laboratory conditions, testing the engine, trying to essentially destroy it, the result was that this simple, reliable, powerful power plant that's at the heart of the CB750, this engine and its successors would go down as some of the greatest engines in the history of production vehicles. If you've owned a CB750 or a CB550 or a CB400, you know these are the engines that pave the way for the future of motorcycle engine development. But the CB750 was so much more than just a regular late 60s motorcycle that maybe had a groundbreaking engine attached to it. Honda made sure that this bike would be better than anything you could buy at pretty much every level, from a new type of electrical system to be used on a motorcycle, taken from the automotive world, to pushing the envelopes in regard to braking. Honda knew from their experience building race bikes that motorcycle performance is often more about how fast you can make the bike stop 
versus how fast it will go. Honda had stumbled upon an aftermarket disc brake setup assembly that was being made for the CB450, and once they got their hands on it, they knew this was the route to go for the CB750. It needed to have disc brakes. So they began developing an innovative hydraulic setup for front disc brakes on the bike. I mean, later down the road, the bike would get all disc brakes, but from the beginning, it was just front disc brakes. And this would really set a precedent for the company going forward to not only make faster, more powerful, more reliable motorcycles, but also to make safer motorcycles. And in the coming years, Honda would continue to improve this technology and bring it to virtually every model in their lineup and push the industry to not just make more powerful engines, but to make safer motorcycles. Now, in terms of the frame and suspension, the CB750 was actually relatively stiff and did lend itself to more sporty riding. I wouldn't say that the motorcycle was the absolute most comfortable motorcycle that you could buy, just in terms of the ride, but because the seat was wide and comfortable, and mainly because the vibration was almost eliminated, at least in comparison to other big bikes at this time, and even bikes going forward, you know, think innovative motorcycles with great riding quality like the Norton Commando. Because the CB750 had that smooth, inline four at the heart of the bike, that was really what made the difference in terms of riding the bike for long distances. And though this engine, which was seemingly straight out of the future and would set the CB750 apart from everything released at this time by other big manufacturers, though the engine is important, it's the whole package from the reliable electric start to the beautiful gauges, the overall classic design, all of it put together so perfectly, this would make the CB750 the obvious choice for riders over Kawasaki's big offerings, over Triumph or BSA or Norton. I mean, Triumph's all new three cylinder Trident would beat the 750 to the punch in terms of being revealed, but everybody quickly forgot that bike when the CB750 was shown at the Tokyo Motor Show. This motorcycle was everything you could ask for as a serious rider who actually wanted to put down a lot of miles and it was amazingly affordable at just $14.95, significantly cheaper than the Trident and the BSA Rocket, and even cheaper than the Sportster by even more. Honda's initial prediction of 1,500 units per year for their new motorcycle quickly became 1,500 units per month. Thousands of riders flocked to see the motorcycle unveiled at the Tokyo Motor Show in October of 69. As Honda had done with the Super Cub, Honda chose to dedicate two plants to the production of the CB750. New machining was developed for the engine, but the lack of experience in building this kind of machine in mass meant quite a lot of growing pains for Honda as a company on the production side. They needed to produce upwards of 100 units per day once things really got going, and they were barely on track to be able to make five a day at the beginning. This meant delays, and ultimately Honda was forced to use a completely new kind of molding. If you're familiar with the CB750s and collecting them, you know that those early Sandcast models are worth quite a bit today because so few of them were made before Honda had to switch how they molded the engine. Ultimately, Honda would figure out how to produce this motorcycle in mass, and it would go down as one of the greatest motorcycles of all time. Now, the CB750 really pushed the industry forward, but not exactly in the way that I think many of us assume. I think we hear that iconic inline four and we observe this bike through the lens of what would come after and through the lens of motorcycle history. And yes, it's true that inline fours would dominate the performance in sport bike market basically until today. And of course, bikes like this, bikes like the Z1, these would be sort of the groundwork for the Japanese companies to be able to build the high revving inline fours that they would build later on. But in many ways, the Kawasaki H2 Mach 3 and Mach 4 would actually sort of be the predecessor to super bikes and sport bikes going forward. I mean, Kawasaki's two strokes, they were that relentless pursuit of speed and power with <laughs> little concern for comfort. Those bikes epitomized what a sport bike is today, much more than a CB750. And also, you could point to the fact that two strokes really did go on to dominate and beat out the high revving four strokes. I mean, two strokes could potentially still be dominating racing if they weren't essentially outlawed. And when you dig in and look at what Honda was actually trying to accomplish with the CB750 and what they did accomplish, the motorcycle itself really wasn't the first superbike. As I said before, Kawasaki's two stroke triples were much more or superbike oriented with that relentless pursuit of performance with little worry about comfort. And on paper, those motorcycles were faster. I do think that sometimes when we look back at the CB750, we overlook why Honda actually made this bike and really the kind of bike 
that they were trying to design and the kind of riders that it was meant for. What the CB750 really was, was a new kind of motorcycle. Sure, incredibly fast, sure, incredibly powerful, but not the fastest bike on the track or on the road. I mean, riders will tell you out on the twisties, even a Bonneville would outperform a CB750. But that's okay when you actually look at the initiative from Honda when making this bike, those original goals set for the team when designing and developing the CB750. It wasn't about making the fastest road going sport bike. It was more about making just the best all around road bike that you could get. Enough power to cruise at highway speeds, all day comfortably, that reliability at every single level that Honda had already proven its machines to have, the ease of use, both in terms of the riding experience, you know, you just open your garage, click a button, and it starts every single time, but also the ease of use when it comes to, you know, having the bike serviced and the service intervals. It was less an out-and-out sport bike and really more of a touring bike, and in that regard, I actually think that we should refer to the CB750 as the first sport touring bike. I mean, just think about this. It's a fast motorcycle for its day, no doubt, but the focus is primarily on comfort and usability. Sport tourers come in lots of different forms. Sometimes they do lean more heavily on the sport side. Sometimes they, you know, are more about comfort. Maybe they're just really fast in a straight line. You know, and in this way, a Hayabusa is a sport touring bike. Maybe they're built on an actual sport bike platform. Maybe they're sort of just developed for sport touring, like, say, a new Moto Guzzi V100. But they all have one thing in common, which is usability and comfort, a performance motorcycle that's actually usable. And in this regard, the CB750 was a new kind of sport touring bike, in line with bikes like the Vincent Black Shadow and the Bruff Superior SS100 that had come before it. Sure, those bikes also produce big numbers for their day. Sure, they're loud and fast and powerful, but when you actually dig in and see what those bikes are about, and even talk to the people who rode those bikes, it's more about being able to put down big miles. It's more about touring with comfort and ease. It's more about just having a high quality machine that's usable, whether you're puttering around in town or needing to pass somebody at 75 miles an hour. And in that sense, the CB750 was a new kind of motorcycle because no other company had made this kind of sport touring bike the way that Honda did with the CB750. They just nailed it. No doubt many of you watching have owned CB750s, and I'd love to hear from you guys and love to hear your stories in the comments below. To further my point in this video, I'll just refer to my parents who owned and rode a CB750 for a bit, and they liked to mainly use it to go golfing. That's right, they would just strap their bags onto the motorcycle, two up, and take it golfing. How weird is that? But also, yeah, that's kind of the point. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next video. Ride safe.